come, stand together and begin by declaring your love of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and generosity that you would send your Son as a sacrifice in our place. We ask you to be with us today, that your Holy Spirit would move in us and through us to accomplish great things in your name. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. As our children come forward, please greet those with whom you're worshiping.
tell me what this is? A flashlight, that's right. And you use this if you're going to go someplace dark, right? Like if you're camping and you know when the, when the sun goes down, there's not going to be any lights, you're going to need one of these. And you can use it when you're hiking. You can use it to look under your bed. It's kind of dark under your bed or maybe in a dark room at your house. And even if the power goes out, has that ever happened to you? Power gone out in your house and you need a flashlight to see in the dark? In the middle of the day, the power went out. You probably didn't need the flashlight as much then. In the middle of the night, that's when you really need it, right? Because flashlights are helpful because they help us see in the dark. And did you know that God wants us to be lights? Yeah, he doesn't actually want us to glow like light bulbs or anything. He's talking about a different kind of light. God wants us to use our words and our actions to shine the light of Jesus. And that way, if people around you see that you're good and that you're faithful, they'll wonder what makes you that way. And you know what you're supposed to say when you're shining your light? You're supposed to say, Jesus made you that way. For example, if you were to see someone fall down, what would you do? You'd help them up. That's right. You'd ask them, are you okay? Is there anything I can do for you? If they need help, you could get them help or a Band-Aid if they scrape their knee. What would you do if you're eating lunch at school? and you notice that one of your friends doesn't have a lunch that day, they forgot it. That's right, you could share your food with them. You could give them some of yours. That's a way that you can shine your light by showing kindness and caring and love to other people because being kind and helping others is what makes God happy because that's when your light shines through. And when you shine a light in the darkness, the darkness disappears and the light takes over. And you can act like this flashlight and shine your light into the lives of those around you. Okay? All right, let's do an echo prayer. Dear God, may your light shine through me. Let me be a blessing to others. Amen. Okay, so we're doing something a little different today because the children's choir is going to sing, and so we want to support all of our friends. So if you're in the choir, you're going to go sit in the front row with Ty, and everybody else, we're just going to sit in the carpet in front of the pews here, okay? All right, so let's scooch forward. So good to welcome each of you to worship today uh, on this very special Sunday when we get to hear our kids sing and together we worship and praise God. We hope that you'll take the card that was in your pew and that you'll record that as uh, your attendance, but also record your heart. Just drop it along in the offering plate as it's received. We pray that you will do the same online and that you'll use uh, the FCCNH uh, prayer uh, ministry as a way to encourage your heart being shared with our community as well. We pray that you will find something to use uh, to represent the bread and the wine so that when we come to that time in service, all will be invited to gather around the table and participate. And now may we continue by hearing the reading of Scripture. Today's reading of Scripture is from the Gospel of John. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. 
So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. May God add his blessing to this reading of the word. Today in our prayers, we lift up Raymond Torres, who is recovering from surgery at Valley Presbyterian. Let us pray. O oh, wonderful creator who sent your redeeming son and sustains us with your spirit, how good it is to come and praise you for the love that you have given us. A beloved gift offered that we might know your loving embrace. Jesus, we start our adoption process into your family. And for this, we are grateful and praise you. We confess, God, that as we come together as a people, sometimes your ways are so mysterious to us that it is difficult to fully understand. We struggle uh, with this love that you have given us. And like confused Pharisees seeking you out in the middle of the night, we wonder how can these things be? Forgive us, God, when we have doubt, and encourage us with the gift of grace. We come to pray for healing. For Raymond and his hospitalization, we ask uh, that you place your hand on him as he recovers from surgery and to send him home soon for a full recovery. Challenge us today, God, that a, a very familiar passage might take on new understanding as we gather in worship today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
many have asked about more information about our recent trip to the Passion Play in Germany and our extended travel uh, in that area. I'm happy to, to share, and I offer this, we got lost. <laughs> Not so much that we didn't make our way home, obviously evidence is in front of you, uh, but we did get lost several times trying to find a starting point. It happened at the very first day uh, of our arrival in Germany. We were in Munich. We started off okay uh, on a walking tour, and everything seemed to make sense, and then we made the mistake of stopping for lunch. We couldn't get back to the starting place. We asked a very kind man walking a little dog, and he gave us instructions, and he sent us to the wrong place. We finally gave up, got a cab, and went back to the hotel. We started the next day. We had the same problem, only we got better information about where the starting place was. It happened in Colmar, uh, searching for the Unterlinden uh, Museum. It houses the enormous, incredible Eisenheim altarpiece. It's a spectacular piece of work. Uh, you can't imagine how big it is. It's as big as the back of our sanctuary. Our tour guide um, pointed us in the direction, but she didn't tell us what the starting point was. So we got lost for a little bit. It happened in Amsterdam uh, when we were headed for the Rijksmuseum. We got to the museum, all right. We went there to see Rembrandt's Night Watch, you know, that great piece of art. We asked the docent how to get there, and the docent said, go up these stairs and turn left. He should have said, go up two sets of stairs and turn right. <laughs> we literally wandered around the museum for half an hour. It's hard if you don't know the starting place, whether you're in a strange city or a, in a, a huge museum, or in our case today, the theological nature of God, known as the Trinity. The starting place is essential. Today is Trinity Sunday, the Sunday set aside to celebrate the three persons of the Godhead. I don't think many of you knew that uh, when you came to church. If you did, you might have stayed away. Uh, the Trinity is so complex that it's hard to know where to start. And that feeling has been around from the beginning. The Trinity was argued about for three centuries until they came to an agreement at the Council of Nicaea in 325. But that didn't end the confusion. Nearly a hundred years later, Augustine wrote a big, massive theological book titled on the Trinity, not very unique, but still about this big. Shortly after, he was walking along the Mediterranean Sea on the north coast of Africa. He saw a little boy, similar to the students we had at the children's moment, uh, who had dug a hole in the sand. And he was taking a bucket over to the Mediterranean Sea and carrying it over and pouring it into his hole. <laughs> Maybe you've seen your children do this. Augustine asks, little boy, what are you doing? He says, I'm transferring the ocean into my hole. And Augustine laughed and chided the little boy, my dear, that's an impossible thing to do. The sea is far too vast and your hole is far too small. He walked on and then it hit him. That's just like his book. The Trinity was far too big and his mind far too small. So I warn you today, it's tough sledding. Because of this, I put a blank on the back of the bulletin, a notes section, uh, because you might be helped in following my confused sermon by a note here or there. Or if you get lost completely, drawing pictures, a, a doodle space. Trinity always falls 
on the first Sunday after Pentecost, an annual occasion to, to look at the theological nature of God in three persons. There's logic behind this. We've just experienced the full breath of God's gift of Jesus, the Son. And last week received on Pentecost the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now it's time to pull all three together. Ready? Well, I'm glad to hear because you guys are always the problem back there. Here we go. God is one. Repeat that out loud. God is one. You might even want to jot it down. Uh, it's a big takeaway for today. We aren't by theists. Even though it sounds a lot the way we talk about God and Jesus in very distinct ways. We aren't tritheists. We are monotheists. God is one. The ancient prayer found in the book of Deuteronomy, recited every day by a faithful Jew, is the foundation of everything we say about God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. God is one. Jesus says this. He sustains this monotheism. My saying in the book of John, I and the Father are one. And when Jesus talks about the promised Holy Spirit, he says, I will not leave you orphan. I am coming to you. Uh, we talk so much about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we need to uh, be reminded that the three manifestations of God are not three separate Deities. It's why you hear in the most classic form of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. Jesus isn't some guy hanging out with God in heaven while the Spirit roams on earth. God is one. But the one God does have three essences. Have you heard that expression? Essence is what the Nicaeans decided uh, to do, the way to describe. Augustine, a hundred years later, said persons. And really, that's what's caught on, God in three persons. But whether they are essences or persons, there is eternal diversity. God has three manifestations. Do we have a headache yet? Anybody doodling? Many have suggested beautiful images of how to explain this one in three and three in one. The, the church father, Elmsom, had a wonderful image. He said, God is like a spring that flows into a stream that flows into a lake. A spring that flows into a stream that flows into a lake. Tertullian said that God is like a plant. The Father is the deep roots, the Son is the shoot that springs forth in spring, and the Spirit is the flowers which open with beauty and fragrance. Augustine, in that big fat book, he wrote one that is famous. The Trinity's is this, God is the lover, Jesus is beloved, and the Spirit is loving. You might want to write that one down. We'll revisit it. God is lover, Jesus is beloved, the Spirit is loving. You know, those images are beautiful metaphors, but they don't tell you where to start. Nicodemus shows us the way. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and he was uh, of the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin, 
uh, that's a big job, a significant power of uh, a position of power and influence. He played a major role in the passion play that we saw in Germany, far greater than it is described in the Bible. The play presented him as a longtime advocate for uh, Jesus. He may have been. We don't know this from Scripture. We do know that one night uh, he went to Jesus because he's lost. He doesn't know where the starting place is, where, where the path to a deeper relationship with God is. So under cover of darkness, he seeks out Jesus, and he says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, and you can uh, do all the signs uh, apart from your presence of God in you. Can you read between the lines? He's more than just a little impressed with Jesus, and he wants ha what Jesus has. He wants to know God. He, he is asking, wh wh where's the starting point? Where's the path to this? And Jesus comes back with an answer that is terribly confusing for Nicodemus, and maybe also for you. It might shock you. It, it, Nicodemus, he says, you don't need God in your life. That's backwards. Uh, you need to come into God's life. Um, it, you don't need God in your life. You need to come into God's life. God doesn't come into your life. It works the other way around. God offers his own life as a gift and beckons you to enter. You need to be in the life of God. In fact, Nicodemus, you need to be born all over again, this time born into God's life. I don't know how to do that, says Nicodemus. I don't know how to be born again into the life of God. So Jesus says, I'm the starting place. I'm the starting point. And then he describes this with two of the most famous verses of Scripture that you probably know by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that everyone who believes in he may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I'm the starting place, Nicodemus, to lead you into this mysterious, wonderful place known as Trinity. Jesus says it even more plainly later. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is not a narrow statement of exclusivity. It is a description of identity and an invitation into the life of God. So do you remember the expression that, of Trinity that Augustine came up with? That God is lover, God is beloved, God, the Spirit is, God is lover, Jesus is beloved, the Spirit is loving. Did you write that down? You, you, you follow me? Okay, now just listen to those two verses in a new way. For the lover so loved the world that he gave the beloved so that everyone who believes in the beloved will not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, the lover did not send the beloved into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might experience loving through the beloved. Now do you see why that's the starting place of a joyful, loving life with God? Jesus invites us into a deeper, loving relationship with God the Father and the Holy Spirit where we discover the family of God. That's what Nicodemus wanted, and I, well, I think it's what all of us are hungry for. So, so what does this all mean for you? Why is it so important? 
At the very least, the Trinity gives depth to our understanding of God. There is beauty and wonder and awe in the depths of God. While God wants us to know him, God wants to be revealed. Understanding the depth of God's being is clearly beyond our full comprehension. Paul writes about it in the 11th chapter of Romans. He says this, the depth and riches of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his ways. For who could know the mind of the Lord? But sometimes we act as if we can know the mind of God. And on those very occasions, it's often when we want to limit God's power or authority over our lives. Uh, we want a small God that we can manage or manipulate in the world. The Trinity invites us into a much, much deeper understanding of God's being. The Trinity also ought to change the way you talk to God. If God is three in one and one in three, we cover the basis, I guess, when we start our prayers by saying, Dear God, but it's a fairly limited description of our conversation. And it may not be fully recognizing the essence of who we're addressing. Listen carefully next week when you hear me offer the pastoral prayer. Maybe you heard it today. I never start off with, dear God, or holy triune God. But I always address the Trinity. The day, creator, redeemer, sustainer, images of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, when we pray our Father who art in heaven, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, do you think Jesus and the Holy Spirit aren't participating? Scripture teaches us that we pray to God through Jesus with the help of the Holy Spirit. Is that new for you? You might write that down. We know this because of the book of Hebrews, which says that Jesus is the holy priest, who, and we can approach God through him because he is always ready to make our intercession. And Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers, in our weakness where we do not know how to pray it's the very spirit that uh, helps us with sighs too deep for words. We pray to God through Jesus with the help of the Holy Spirit. And Trinity should not just change your view of God or change your conversation. It should expand your relationship with God. You are invited into God's loving family. Literally adopted into the family of one God in three persons. You receive this adoption, Paul says, when you cry, Abba, Father. And that is the very spirit bearing witness uh, of our spirit as children of God. And if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. To me, that's a very powerful image. The triune God is not only opened a way for you to know his love uh, through Jesus, but to experience his very presence when you're adopted into God's family of three persons. Being adopted, have a family is wonderful news for all of us. But for some especially, it's really good news right now. Depending upon the circumstances of your life, you might feel broken or insignificant or uh, you might feel as if you're not loved. But you are loved by a holy family. You might feel empty and lost, but you still are loved by three expressions of perfect love. You might be worried uh, about decisions you've made, choices that you've done in the past, people who you've damaged and hurt, but you have found the starting place. 
you belong to the family. That is ultimately what the Trinity is about, about belonging a community, about God in three persons. So listen once again. For the lover so loved the world that he gave the beloved so that everyone who believes the beloved may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, the lover did not send the beloved to, into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be experienced loving through the beloved. As complex as it seems, it's really as simple as that which causes me to give thanks in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Are you the type of person that lives your life dreaming about someday, someday when I lose weight or when I finish school or when I'm more financially stable, I can really go for it and live life to the fullest, whether it's booking that trip to Fiji or applying for that dream job. If these past two years have taught us anything, it's YOLO. You only live once, and that time is now. You can say it in a number of ways. Carpe diem, why wait? If not now, when? The idea of not wasting time was echoed in college commencement speeches this year. President Joe Biden told graduates at the University of Delaware that there's no time to be on the sidelines. Atlanta rapper Ludacris exhorted Georgia State University graduates that you're not too young or too inexperienced. You're not too broke or resource poor. Say to yourself, I am enough. I'm just right. The message is opportunity is right before us, young and old, and we shouldn't wait for the so-called perfect moment. It's an attitude we can apply to doing something great for God in the present, to giving back, not when we retire, not when the kids finally graduate from college, and dare I say not when we can finally drive a stake in inflation. The Bible even tells us not to wait for better conditions or when things are more convenient to do good works. Proverbs 3, 27, 28 says, do not withhold good from those to whom it's due when it's in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you, when you already have it with you. So let's not delay. Book that trip, polish off your resume, opportunity is knocking. Will the diaconate please come forward to accept our tithes and offerings and for our friends at home watching, you can find ways to donate on your screen. <laughs>
I just want to start by thanking Pastor Randy for reminding me that people know a lot more than I do. <laughs> I think oftentimes when we're lost or we're confused, the easy thing to do is to go back to where you started and see if you can make that path go. I also work to simplify things and not overcomplicate it. And when I think about my faith, that's sometimes the easiest thing for me to do, to simplify and understand what this church means, what this table means, and what it means to be a Christian. I definitely won't look at 316 the same way again. And I think about what our beloved did on that night. And for us, that we weren't around during the time Jesus was on this earth. And so for us, this table is really the start. And this table represents that salvation that the lover gave to us by giving up his only beloved. This is my favorite part of the service. Is we have an opportunity in a moment after partaking in this meal every week to think about what this means for us. And just as we're invited into the loving family of God, so are all of you invited to the loving family of this church. For everyone is invited to this table. Regardless of who you are, where you come from, or whether you believe you deserve this or not, this table is yours, this gift is yours, because the lover gave it for all of us. And so on the same night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And likewise, he took the cup which was filled with wine, and he said, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sin. For these gifts of bread and wine, let us pray. O wonderful lover who gave us the beloved, we come indeed with bread and wine before us, knowing it represents body and blood, sacrifice for us. May your loving spirit fill these gifts in us as we partake. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. The bread, is it not the body of our Lord Jesus Christ? The cup, is it not his bloodshed? All who are here and profess Jesus are invited uh, to participate uh, as you receive the elements. The bread will be passed first. Uh, then the tray with communion. There are sanitary cups in that tray if you would prefer the simple kit. May all who are here participate.
each Sunday we extend an invitation to those who have not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. We invite you to begin that journey today by coming forward and saying yes. If you are seeking a church home, our hearts, our doors are open to you. You may transfer your membership into this church by also coming forward. Together we stand and sing this invitation. today continues in the Peace Garden as we have our meet and greet. We hope that you can be in fellowship there. Shall we close with a prayer? Bless now this community. Send them forth to know that you are one. The one lover, beloved, and loving. Amen. Thank you.